morning. We are going to continue our study in Galatians. If you got your book, open your book. If you got your Bible, open your Bible to Galatians chapter 4. And we'll get set. A few weeks ago, uh, I'll let y'all know and introduce my favorite, most wonderful sister in law in the whole wide world. And now her husband and the rest of the kids are here. So y'all be sure to meet them. And meet James, her husband. Go ahead and add a few prayer lists. And, and if y'all want to take care of Becky the rest of this week, cash, check, whatever you need. No, I would have traded for that. I've got a wonderful, wonderful sister in law and family. Okay, Galatians chapter 4. Verses 21 through 31. Talks about two covenants. The introduction that the, that the author gives us, he kind of goes into a little bit of explanation about, uh, about parables and talks about an allegory. An allegory. And uh, when I first started studying this lesson, I saw that word allegory and saw her girlfriend was over at the house and she scored a 31 on her ACT, so I turned to her and said, Olivia, what is it? An allegory. And the fact that she scored a 31 on her ACT and looked at me and said, I don't know, I hope much better having to look that up. <laughs> but a parable, as we all know, it's a it's a uh, a earthly story with a heavenly meaning. An allegory is a story, a poem, or a picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning, typically a moral or political one. So that's what an allegory means. Uh, and Paul used one other time an allegory uh, to kind of explain what we're going to talk about today as far as the two covenants, and we're going to get to that. Uh, the one thing that I uh, noticed at the end of, of, of the introduction in our, in our lesson book was he says, as much as apparent, from the earliest days of the Christian faith, believers have struggled to understand how they are to learn from the Old Testament. And I think I said a few weeks ago, and I'm just going to throw it out there again just because it's, it's something that, uh, that I have learned, and I'm going to say it again, is I think that a lot of what we can get out of the Old Testament is learning about God. In the New Testament, we learn about Jesus, we learn about Christ, we learn about uh, the gospel that was preached. We get to know Jesus. You read that Old Testament, and you're going to learn about God and how He dealt with His folks and His people. Uh, so I'm just answering that question that y'all present. Okay. As I stated earlier, Paul used a, an allegory uh, previously in the book of Romans. And it's Romans chapter 11. And I'm going to turn to it. And we're going to talk a little bit about it because it, it, uh, I think it has a very good message. And it's going to help lead us into today's uh, lesson about uh, Sarah and Hagar and Isaac and Ishmael. But in Romans uh, chapter 11, Paul's using uh, an olive tree. And he's talking about the Old Testament, the Jews that followed the Old Testament. And folks that believed uh, in Christ and were Christians. And it specifies that the olive tree was a cultivated olive tree. Uh, I'm not really sure what special about a cultivated olive tree versus a regular olive tree. But it was a cultivated olive tree. Uh, and in that uh, example that he's using, he says branches were broke off. And wild olive branches 
were grafted to the olive tree. He explains that the branches that were broke off were broke off due to unbelief. And I think it's safe to say, and y'all definitely jump in because I don't get everything right up here, that the olive tree were the Jews that believed in Christ. And they had faith in Christ. And the Jews that said, eh, I'm going to stick the old law, uh, those were the branches that were broke off. And they were broke off because they did not have faith in Christ. And the wild olive branches that were grafted to the tree, I'm taking those as being the Gentiles. And they were grafted to that tree to be, uh, to, I think it says, benefit from the rich root. And the root being the promise, the grace, the salvation, the redemption, the promise that God gives. Uh, Paul also warns those while olive branches, the Gentiles, don't be arrogant. Don't, don't, don't think you're more than, than what you are just because you're part of God's children. Uh, and apparently that, the fact that he had to say it, uh, apparently there were some Gentiles with puffed out chests thinking they were, they were something more than, than what they were. But, but what they were was great in the children of God. Uh, Something else that, that, uh, that Paul talks about uh, in that in, in, in Romans is in addition to not being arrogant, uh, and I was when I was doing this, I was sitting on my front porch and there's a little tree in front of me. What supports a tree? What's its foundation? It's the roots. Uh, and one thing I will say is. You know, a tree the branch, between the branches, the trunk, the roots, there's a relationship. Uh, but those branches aren't going to have anything without the roots. Uh, and the, uh, the, the importance, all right, let me rephrase that. Paul continued to let, uh, in, in his message here, he, he let the uh, the grafted wild olive branches know, hey, the branches that are broke off, they can be grafted on too. Uh, so that also kind of lets me know, lets us know, uh, if, if you are broke off, if you're separated, God's ready to bring you back, and and, and that's a beautiful message. Uh, and I think today. Nation to accept Christ, uh, they'd be grafted into that tree. That's what the Bible says. Um, but he also lets us know in verse 22 in Romans, Behold then the kindness and severity of God. And like I said, and I've mentioned it before, if you look at how God dealt with his people in the Old Testament, it was pretty severe. When they, when they messed up, when they uh, did not uh, follow God, he dealt with them pretty severely. Uh, and that's one thing I think we need to, uh, I guess, appreciate, but also keep in mind. You know, a lot of times today, uh, we don't, we don't have or feel the impact, I think, that the Jews did. When, uh, when we, when we have our walk through life and our walk with God, when we mess up, when we fall short, when we fail, we're not banished into a desert for however many years. We're not, we don't suffer for generations and generations and generations. So uh, just, again, something to, to, that I always try to remember, uh, God doesn't play. Uh, and he, he does have severity when you don't do what you're supposed to do. Something else that I liked about uh, the, the, the lesson that, that, that Paul presented in Romans, or something else that I got out of it was just the fact, the example that he used. He used a tree. Uh, he also used 
something that they'd be very familiar with. I mean, over there, I spent a little bit of time, everybody knows everything about olives. Olives is like Florida's orange. I mean, olives is it. And uh, just a little sidetrack, when I was over there, there was a little place uh, just outside of Mont Jordan, and it was, it was a, an olive store. I never realized how many olives there were. But they were very, very proud of the Jordanian olive. Uh, I got a little bit of, of all of them. But he used something that they would understand. And he used a tree. And I think that, that it wasn't a mistake that he used that. Uh, whether the believing Jews or whether the Gentiles that were grafted to the tree, the fact that he used a tree lets me know also, and it should let all of us know, what does a tree do? It continues to grow. And I think that's another lesson that we can get out of, uh, out of that example that Paul used, that allegory that he used was, I think there's an expectation that as we are drafted to God's tree, to uh, become a child of his, be part of his plan is, we're expected to grow. Uh, so just throwing that out there. Anyone have any comments about Paul's example used in Romans? Because we're already getting into the lesson. More about uh, Hagar and, and uh, Sarah. Y'all don't be bashful today. Okay. In Galatians, Paul makes his point to let us know that Hagar was a was a bondwoman, uh, and he made a point that Sarah was a free woman. He, uh, the, the, Paul also makes sure that we understand that not only was, was Hagar a bondswoman, uh, he, he relates Hagar and Ishmael to being of the flesh and references them to the old law. We're going to get into that. Whereas with Sarah and Isaac, they're referenced uh, as, or she's referenced as a free woman. And he kind of references them as, as the new covenant. Um, one of the things, and, and I had to read this a few times to kind of, I don't know, I guess to get the full meaning. And maybe I don't, I'm not convinced I have the full meaning. But uh, I'm just going to share with you some of the things that I got out of it. The fact that, that Hagar uh, and Ishmael, the fact that it stressed that, that she was a bondswoman, and not a free woman. Uh, obviously, we refer to when you're being when you're under the law, you're you're a slave to the law. Uh, you're not free. You're bound. You were bound to that law. And in the, in the old covenant, the Old Testament, you you were bound too. Uh, the fact that he references or makes a reference. Of Hagar and Ishmael being of the flesh. Really had to think about that one. And uh, I guess the, the, what I got out of that was God gave the law to his people, and that was God's part. I gave you the law. The people's part was to follow, it was their job, their responsibility follow that law. God gave it, you follow it. And it was on those people to follow all those laws. Uh, and I think that maybe that's one of the reasons why Paul here express, or refers to Hagar and Ishmael as being of the flesh. There's more reasons than that, but I think that's one of them. Uh, and I'm going to just, a couple of things I'm going to pull out of, of what the, the author of the lesson says. It uh, reminds us that the law for Israel was given in, okay, no, no, not that part. The, the birth of Ishmael, Paul said, illustrated a larger principle. The principle was that human initiatives fail to bring about the purposes of God. Skip it down. God's part in giving the law and man's part was doing it. 
Because there, because there was sin, all were condemned. So, I mean, he, he points it out there. God gave it. People had to follow it. Everybody failed because we're all human. And they were condemned. Sarah, by contrast, was a free woman. And represents the new covenant. Uh, and she represents the promise that we have now. The uh, and, and I think that the, 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 the big part here is Old Covenant, New Covenant, Hagar's Old Covenant, Sarah's New Covenant. Uh, I think there's a lot more to get out of this lesson today also. Uh, besides what each one represented. The, uh, well, Ishmael and Isaac, they both had the same father. Does that have any meaning to y'all? What part does that play in any of this? God's the father of everyone. Uh, and in this particular situation, both covenants came from God. Uh, I, thought, I thought that that was important. The promise was given to Abraham back in Genesis 15, you're going to have a son. God gave that promise to Abraham at the time of Abraham. And that was in chapter 15. And I don't know how time went. It doesn't really, I didn't find the, the time, a timeline in there. But in chapter 15, God says, hey, hey, you're going to have a kid. I'm going to bless you with a son. You're going to have an heir. In chapter 16, my pronunciation is probably Sarai. When Sarah did, Sarai said, hey, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you my maid servant. I'm going to have children through her since, since I can't have any kids. Uh, and then that was their game plan. Because Isaac don't roll around to chapter 21. And again, not sure the time frame and how all that worked, but uh, they kind of took matters into their own hands. And I guess we don't have the full story, but if God told Abram, I'm going to bless you the son, did he keep that from Sarai? I, I don't think he, I don't, I mean, I don't think he would. That's pretty exciting news. Very next chapter, Sarah's like, here's, here's my game plan. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, so, and if you go back to Genesis and you read the rest of the story, what happened when, uh, when uh, Hagar conceived? And, and that, that was Sarah's plan. What happened when she conceived? Sarah, Sarah was mad, very mad. Uh, you know that whole saying, be careful, be careful what you wish for, because you might get it? Well, what she was wishing for, her game plan, came to fruition. And she turned around, I got it broken down here somewhere, but it was basically, she turned around and played Abram uh, and, and Hagar for this being. And she was wrong. Uh, and the one thing that I think we can learn from that is, again, careful what you wish for. But what happened as a result of them taking their, the, the, the plan of having a kid into their hands instead of waiting on God? And not only that, and, and that is huge. Some smaller things that came about also. How did Abraham feel as the story progresses and Sarah says, I, I, I don't want him around no more. I don't want her around no more. I don't want him around no more. I've got my kid now. Because God did bless them with Isaac. And she wants them gone. It wasn't just Sarah, who got all mad and frustrated and feelings hurt and all sorts of stuff. How did, how did Abraham feel when Sarah basically, I want them gone? 
How did Abraham feel about that? He did what she said. He did what she said. He was distressed greatly. Uh, and for all of us parents out there, that's his kid. And, and it wasn't just, hey, here's your bags, and we'll see you. He gave him some bread, gave him some water, and hey, there's the wilderness. It's seven. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if the intent was <clears throat> walk to your death because you're walking out to the wilderness, or what. But the bottom line was he was letting his son go, never see him again. Uh, Yes. And yes. And before was that before he said on? I have to go back and read. Well, another thing though, or another thing when when Hagar and Ishmael were sent off. Uh, again, just building on the the fleshly plan of having a kid, it got to the point where Hagar, either I mean her and her son, I mean they were in bad shape. She thought her son was going to die, and it says that she was a bow shot's length away from him because she didn't want to see him die. Uh, and again, the emotional impact of a mother and a child uh, or that her kid was going to die. Again, it's just more consequences of that fleshly plan instead of waiting on God's promise. Helping God out. Yes. I guess Bill had 12 sons and a daughter. Jacob had 12 sons and a daughter. Yes, Bill. God said the old law. Jacob represented the new law. And he was drove in the wilderness not the law was nailed to the cross. And, and, and that was my next point is it didn't just stop now. What John says is right. An angel came, she was crying, and it was, hey, you're going to be okay. He opened her eyes, there was a well, and, and she was told, I think, at that same point also, Ishmael was going to become the father of a great nation. Uh, you're not going to die out here. He's going to be something because he was a descendant of Abraham. Of Abraham. But I guess the point I wanted to make is it wasn't just Sarah getting her feelings hurt and being upset and mad because Hagar got pregnant. It just it kept going and kept going and kept going and kept going. And I think that a lesson that we can learn from that is when we preempt God and his plan, and we got a better idea, or we're smarter than God, or we think we're smarter than God, and we do our plan instead of waiting on His, there's there's repercussions sometimes. And, and it's not just a, well, this one thing bad happens to me. It can be, it can build and build and build and build. And in this situation, I think it built and built and built. Hey, Mark? Yes. So the definition when God told Abraham, Abraham or Abraham that um, Ishmael was going to become a, a father of a great nation, that didn't necessarily mean a good nation, right? It meant a no. large nation? Yes. Okay. And I don't want to get too deep into it because I'm not sure 100%. But uh, the Muslim faith holds Ishmael way up there. <laughs> With Hagar, uh, I mean, some people say that he was the not the father of the Muslim faith, but he's a, he was he was up there. And the fact that they say also that, that Ishmael and, and Hagar are both very very close to Mecca, which is their holy city that they go visit, and they get to wear a different color of a uh, headgear. But I, I don't I don't know if if, if that's Ishmael's legacy or not. I don't know. But I do know that even though he became a great nation in size, 
What's he, where, where, where does the Bible say he, he ended up as a great nation? Out of the wilderness. Uh, so, again, some additional things we can learn. Go ahead. It, it said Israel time would be against mine. Yes. When they came out of Egypt, and they first once they run into the Ishmael's, the Ishmaelites, their sentence, when they crossed the Red Sea, that was the people that gave them more trouble. And they were, they were the citizens of the Sinai Peninsula. And we're the only people that can identify their full body. Um, something else. Something else, and, and again, I want to relate it back to the lesson of the two covenants. When Hagar and Ishmael were sent away, uh, yes, he became a great nation in size. Uh, they didn't die in the wilderness. But the one thing that Ishmael did not get that Isaac did get was the, the inheritance, the, the blessing from the Father. And again, the author, more so Paul, I think, used this to let these folks know, hey, I mean, here's something else y'all understand besides Olives. Y'all know about Jewish history. And Birthright inheritance, that was a big, that was a huge thing. We don't hear anything about Moses' other children. Abraham's other children, right? He had a whole string of them after, with his wife, after Sarah. And so, and we don't, we don't hear anything about them, just of Israel and Israel. And, and it's huge. And if you look at, and we should have done that, there's a verse in there uh, in the Old Testament where God talks about Isaac. I mean, and Isaac was a man. Uh, he, he was he was he was a, a very good man. He did he walked with God as far as his life and everything. He was praised. And you know what? Uh, and again, I think Paul used this to let his audience that he was talking to know Ishmael when he got when he left well that's what we need to do as far as the, 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 the Jewish uh, laws that they were trying to keep going they need to go they need to have in the wilderness they need to be gone and you're not going to have a part of it this is what you're going to be a part of and it was God's promise uh so again, that was something else. That was something that I that I got out of it as well. Uh, something else that uh, I wanted to, to, to throw out there. And a few weeks ago, we talked about a covenant and what a covenant is. And just like in this, uh, God made a promise. And one of the things that I that I read in, in this book is it's, it's under the section of Abraham's two sons. It says, law required the involvement of two parties, God the giver and man the recipient. Promise, on the other hand, was the product of one. God alone made the promise. He alone was responsible for its fulfillment. Hagar, the slave girl, symbolized the bondage of law. Sarah the free woman symbolized the blessings of God's promise. And I wanted to ask y'all that little section that I just read of promise on the other hand was the product of one. God alone made a promise. God did make a promise. But it does say, and, and I guess the real reason, the, I guess the issue that I might have with that little phrase right there, that God alone made a promise, which he did. But it does say in Genesis 15, 6 that Abraham had faith and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So God made the promise. I think it came to fruition to 
parts because Abraham had his faith and it was counted to him as righteousness. Well, and I don't know if God's promises, he said, I will do this if there was always a condition set on the fulfillment of the promise. And, and our, and that condition for us today is to believe and have faith and to walk with him. Uh, you know, a few weeks ago I did stress that I made it a point that we are saved by nothing but God's grace. Well, the second part of that is we receive that through our faith, through our obedience to him. Because um, you can't have one without the other. Uh, and like I said, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not too bashful at work or wherever. I like to talk about religion to other folks. I like to understand where they're coming from on what they believe. Because I'm going to tell you what I believe and I'm going to tell you why. I may not be that eloquent, may not be that good at it, but I'm going to let you know, here's what I believe and here's why. And it always interests me to hear some of the thoughts that are out there. In fact, my wonderful sister, like I, long I, and I got to talk about that uh, this morning also. But it's just, it, it, it is truly amazing. Uh, so many examples of what we're to do, how we're to do, why we're to do, and it's just ignored. And the one thing that, that I would say, and that I tell folks is, God's got a way. And it's, and, it's, and it's up to us to follow. The Bible's not a smorgasbord. Uh, you can't pick and choose. And you're, you're either a child of his or you're not a child of his. Uh, so, but just kind of wrapping things up this morning. Uh, and and the, the author does a pretty good job here wrapping it up. As God fulfilled his promise when Isaac was born, he has fulfilled his promise with the coming of Christ. The way of human, the way of human obedience to law failed. God has saved. God has saved by His grace. Depending on the promise, man's part in redemption is to grasp the offer of salvation through faith in God's faithfulness. So He basically just said what I just said. God's salvation is out there. We need to do our part as well. Uh, any other comments, questions? Yes, sir. Abraham had. Go ahead. Abraham had eight sons. He had six by his second wife. And and like John said, I mean, he had, he had what twelve total? <coughs> or how many, how many did Abraham have total? Eight. eight? And we don't hear about none of them. I don't know why. It is what it is. Uh, yes, sir. In the beginning. In the garden, the woman came to Adam, persuading him to sin. We pay on the consequences of that very sin today. Sarah came to Abraham, persuaded him to take Hagar, and we suffer from that same sin today. And the new covenant we have today is through only Jesus Christ. So that's the covenant that we need to actually be trying to live uh, on. Yeah, and I was going to bring that up, but I didn't want to make it sound like we were picking on women. I'm not bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But I, I actually, actually wrote that down. I was like, man, I got, I got my sister-in-law for another week. I was like, I'm not picking on women. I'm just saying. I know, I know. If, if, if we do not follow God's instructions, Generate, if, if, if I don't follow God's instructions, generations under me are going to suffer because of my sins. This, it's just a fact. If you sin, consequences are to be paid. And you have to live them. And, 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 and that's it. And hopefully I got that message out. It's God's way. Uh, we saw what happens when folks think that they know better or they preempt. God's plan with their plan. 
And like you, like you just said, generations and generations and generations pay for it. Yes, ma'am. It seems to me that when they were expecting Isaac, they had to recognize at that point that they had made a terrible mistake. But I think they compounded it by sending Ishmael and Hagar out. They were a reminder that they had not followed God's way. But I'm tempted to think if they had stayed, it would have played out very differently. But they wanted to get rid of that reminder. Do you know why I think that they had to be sent out? Because I think it was definitely God's plan. I'm going to have Paul come along and he's going to use this as an example of how separate the old law needs to be from the new covenant. Because if she would have hung out, Paul wouldn't have had this example. You can never have two women in one kitchen. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Whether it does or whether it doesn't, there's still a whole lot of fighting going on. There's still a whole lot of fundraising. 
risk going on. And I think that if, I think things would be much, much different if God's initial chosen people accepted Christ. I think things would probably be a little different over there. I think maybe the Bible tells us things would probably be a little different over there. But anyhow, I really, really appreciate y'all's uh, comments, and uh, we will see y'all next Sunday morning. <clears throat>